Hey everyone, thanks for joining Baltimore County Fire Department uh, EMS Academy. Um, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and an ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm a riding member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Fitzpatrick, Thanks for what you guys do every day. Thank you for your dedication for lifelong learning. Uh, shout out to Ashley Brooks, who's a volunteer at Pikesville, a volunteer fire company who is helping us with our IT platform tonight. Uh, Ashley will be sending out a link in the chat at some point during this training. Uh, click on that link, enter a little bit of information, and you can get your MIM CEUs. So if you want your MIM CEUs, keep an eye out on the chat as well. We will announce it. Uh, click on that link and enter some information. Uh, to get your CEUs. So tonight we're super excited to have with us uh, Karen Deppa and Michael Donahue. Karen is the lead author of the 2016 Springer ebook, Resilience Training for Firefighters, an approach to prevent behavioral health problems. The daughter of a volunteer firefighter, Karen founded Pilot Light Resilience Resources after earning her Master's of Applied Positive Psychology degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Together with Pilot like co principal Mike Donahue, she developed a resilient skills class for fire and rescue departments called Respond with Resilience to proactively encourage a foundation of resilient training and behaviors. Karen's most significant lessons in resilience came in 2012 as she and her family helped her teenage son to recover from and thrive in the aftermath of a severe stroke. Dr. Michael Donahue is a progressive EMS. Our emergency services professional providing expertise in research planning, delivery, and training. Mike has over 45 years of fire service experience with 32 years in frontline response. He spent seven years as a volunteer firefighter EMT in Prince George's County, Maryland, and served 35 years in Montgomery County, Maryland, fire and rescue services before retiring in 2012 as an assistant chief section chief of the fire marshal's office. A member of IFFF Local 1664, Mike remains active in the fire service, teaching at the National Fire Academy, consulting, and serving on the Mid-Atlantic Life Safety Conference Steering Committee. He holds a PhD from Oklahoma State University in Fire and Emergency Management Administration. Karen and Mike, thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight, and thank you for sharing all of your expertise. Uh, before we turn it over, though, I do want to just turn it over uh, briefly uh, to Chief Shenning. Chief Shenning. Hey, thanks, Dr. Bernholtz. Hey, welcome, everybody. Glad to see everybody back. I know we had a little hiatus over the, the summer, and everybody's excited to um, start resuming classes like this again. I think this is truly one of the um, best platforms that are within the region um, for EMS training. Where else can you go on a Thursday night um, receive truly this quality and caliber of training that we, um, Dr. Baron Holtz is normally able to set up. This is the kind of stuff that people pay a lot of money to travel out to conferences for and with it um, and, and receive this type of training. Um, and CEOs to, CEOs to boot, we all like those as well. Um, but special thanks, um, I say it all the time to Dr. Baron Holtz, uh, unselfishly, you know, takes his time, takes the time, sets these kind of things up. And I think what you'll find tonight, um, after talking with Karen and Mike, um, here is just how, how he's able to re read the landscape of what's going on in EMS and so find some topics that are just so timely. And I, I really, really can't think of one other than, you know, back when we first started with COVID to be able to come up with one this timely for things that are actually affecting our providers. Like I said, we do a lot of good clinical topics, but so sometimes this is a topic that we forget about a lot, which is probably one of the more, and if not the most important, is that we take care of ourselves and we take care of each other. We're out there. I don't have to say to this crew, you guys that are out there running these calls, I'm shielded up in the office. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, you know, we, we sense and, and, and we, we hear and we talk to folks and what you guys have been doing over the last several weeks to months, especially with this, with the pandemic and what's going on right now with some of the hospital wait times and some of the delays, you know, and the just an enormous amount of challenges that you guys are facing that we hadn't faced even a year, two years ago. And despite all those challenges, we continue to maintain high values, excellent care. Um, you know, our call volume, we're running a lot and, and, and it's just, a testament to the professionalism of the people that are out there doing this 
job that, you know, we're not seeing an increase of complaints. We're not seeing hospitals complaining that, you know, you know, we're being uncivil to folks, you know, and like I said, this is one of those things I really th thank you guys for this class. Thanks again, to Dr. Barinholtz for setting this up. I hope everybody takes something out of something that's the key to adult education is that you can walk out of here with something that you can apply. I really, in this day and age, can't think of anything that's more important than we take something out of this class of something that we can apply to help ourselves in the next couple months. So thank you guys very much. And I will turn it over to the presenters. All right, and I'm going to share my screen so that we can get the slides up. Okay, can everybody see that? Looks good. All right, mm -hmm. good, thank you. So hello and welcome. We are Karen Deppa and Mike Donahue of Pilot Light Resilience Resources. Welcome to our presentation, which we call Self-Care Activities, Resilient Skills for First Responders. Uh, again, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to Dr. Baron Holds and Chief Shenning for the invitation to provide training in this important field of behavioral health. I've been thinking a lot this month about the 20th anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attacks on our country and how that was really the beginning of a long overdue focus on behavioral health and wellness in this country. Uh, I've also been thinking a lot this past year about the debt that we owe to our nation's emergency responders for being on the front lines of the COVID-19 response and how behavioral health is, as Chief Shedding said, as important as it ever was. September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And you may be familiar with statistics that indicate that more first responders have died by suicide than in the line of duty in recent years. Peer support programs, which I know you have at Baltimore County, and lowering the stigma and fear of asking for help are characteristics of organizations that have been most successful in lowering their suicide rates. Tonight, Mike and I look forward to sharing some information about how resilience shows up in the emergency responder community and to give you some tools that you can use to take care of yourself during what remains of COVID times, hopefully not too much longer, and as we transition back into quote unquote more normal times. Okay, uh, Karen, before we get started, let me point out something because you, you mentioned normal times. Um, I have to say that for people in, in the fire rescue service, there's no such thing as a normal time. Um, it's just a function of, of, of how we live. Um, you know, we live in a world of crisis management. That's what we do. That's the, the, the path we chose. Um, so the unfortunate part about living in crisis management is that tends to rub off on us. And uh, it doesn't necessarily rub off on us in a positive way. And that's one of the things we're trying to do here. Um, it, it's, it's not always for the best. Uh, we, we tend to get very cynical and hardened over time and that makes things worse and makes it more difficult for us to adjust and, and look for those soft skills that, that uh, benefit us so much. Mm, indeed. Yes. Thank you, Mike. So why is self-care so important? Finding the time on a regular basis to give yourself what you need intellectually, emotionally, physically, spiritually, socially. It's gonna allow you to better adapt to changes in your environment, to build strong relationships and to recover from setbacks. In other words, to be resilient. Okay, so how does this relate to our universe? Um, we're emergency responders. Uh, Self-care enables us to position ourselves better to, to help the people we're out there charged with, with, with helping. And, you know, there's an old adage out there that says if you if you don't take care of yourself first, it's awful difficult for for you to take care of other people. And that's what this uh, this whole presentation is about is, you know, help self care. And, you know, what do you do? So, uh, you know, that's a question for, for everybody to, to ponder here at the moment. Um, if you feel like putting something up on the chat, that would be great. But what do you do for self care? Do you. Uh, how do you decompress? How do you absorb the shocks and disappointments that are common in this industry? Uh, you know, the SIDS death that you can't do anything about. The, uh, the you know, the, the family that loses everything in a fire and all their memories and everything else are gone. Um, and it's incredibly disappointing for them. 
So what do we do and how, how do we decompress? Maybe it's a hobby, maybe spending time with family, maybe it's exercise. Personally, I like the woodwork. Um, it's been years since I've been retired, but the stresses are still there. I'm still very much engaged. And for me, making sawdust is a lot of fun and a great way to decompress. Yeah, we'd actually like to conduct a poll for those of you participating on Zoom this evening. Uh, and the question is, what do you do for self-care? Um, I don't see my, my controls right now, Sean. There you go. Thank you. So if you would, choose as many as apply. Mm. Okay. Keep going. We have less than half of the people have participated. Okay. Now we've got half. Karen, can you actually see the responses? I can see the responses coming in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dark humor. Yes. Absolutely. Mm. Very nice, shutting off social media. Karen, I cannot see the responses, so. Okay. Oh, there we go, I got it now. Still learning the Zoom thing. I think we're okay to end the poll, you guys? Sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oops. Is it sharing now? Yes. Perfect. It's interesting that exercise and spending time with family and friends are the two most uh, prevalent. And then, of course, participating in sports or hobby. I like that. Yeah. And that should be watch your favorite movie or show, but I guess you figured that one out. Ah, oh, so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. John John Hickman says, "Leave work at work and don't bring bring it home." I like that. It's awful difficult to do that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Riding horses. Oh, we got an animal lover here. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Uh, but uh, you know. I, these things that you do to take care of yourself, I will say, contribute to your resilient responses. So, now can I get this off of my screen? There we go. Our objective for this evening. Oh, there we go. That should have been. Our objective for this evening is to guide you through the creation of three tools for your self-care toolbox that will help you strengthen your resilient responses. We'll start by talking about what resilience is, and then we'll explain the three pillars of resilience that research shows are most important to the emergency response community. Next, we're going to guide you through three activities to help you create personalized tools to strengthen each of the three pillars of resilience. These tools will be yours to use and practice after you leave this workshop to strengthen your resilient responses. Yeah, Karen, the, uh, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that uh, this material we're covering tonight is just a sampling of the resilience practice. Uh, there's a lot more science and practice behind this presentation uh, that we offer in a full day class or over three Zoom sessions, but that's, you know, we, we have to work within the constraints we have. Um, also, for the audience, please, if you have something you want to say, use the chat function. Um, Karen and I will not necessarily be monitoring it, uh, but Dr. Barinholtz will be. Um, so if there's something comes up, he's, he's going to be our gatekeeper. Let us know. Um, and uh, well, you can also raise your hand. I believe that's a possibility in here. So we'll, we'll try to keep things active and keep our eye on that. Okay. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, we're obligated to point out that 
the information we're sharing today is not a substitute for the knowledge, skill, or judgment of qualified healthcare professionals. If you have any health or medical questions or concerns, please consult a physician or other healthcare professional. Okay. Um, I think uh, where we at here that um, along with what Karen said, this is just you know uh, another tool in the toolbox. And uh, we're certainly not the end all be all of, of, uh, of um, resilience training and uh, resilience. So keep that in mind. Um, we just want to help give you something to work with and, and, and go from there. Tools in the toolbox. Yep. Uh, another thing we encourage you to do as we go through this presentation is to adopt what's called a growth mindset. So the truth is a lot of what we're going to cover tonight might sound like common sense or something that your grandmother might have told you. But a growth mindset in this context is simply being open to what you might learn from something, even if you've heard it before. Maybe this time you'll have a different perspective on it, or maybe you've had some experience since the last time you heard it that gives you a new insight. So if you find yourself thinking, I know this stuff already, replace that thought with, what can I learn from this? And if you hear a voice in the back of your head saying, this won't work for me, replace that thought with, how can this work for me? It's a subtle shift in thinking, but it can make a world of difference in what you get out of this training. So since we've already been introduced, maybe we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on who we are, but I always like to start my workshops with a tribute to my dad, Tony Fernicola. He passed away in 2004 which happens to be the last time the 17 year cicadas invaded our area in case you're keeping track. Uh, Dad was a volunteer firefighter the whole time I was growing up in New Jersey and uh, he suffered from depression and anxiety for most of his adult life. I don't know if it was related to his experiences as a firefighter, but I do know that I felt really helpless to do anything to ease his pain and suffering. So um, after I got my master's and was ready to kind of make a shift in my career, I had been working in fire prevention advocacy for the National Association of State Fire Marshals for many years. And, um, and so I brought my interest in addressing behavioral health issues together with my love and respect for the fire and emergency services that I'd been spending my career working with and whose culture I'd been exposed to growing up. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland with my husband on a farm that includes a flock of sheep, a Sicilian donkey, which is a miniature donkey, draft horses, cats, a fish pond, and other assorted wildlife, including our adult kids that visit on occasion. Mike and I set up Pilot Light Resilience Resources to work on sharing the science and skills of resilience with the emergency response community. Mike, over to you. Okay, um, I'm gonna blame my dad also. Uh, he started off as a volunteer in Prince George's County. And of course, I had to do some of that myself. Um, but I also come from a family of firefighters. Uh, my brother worked in DC, uh, retired from there after 30 years. And my brother-in-law is still on the job in Anne Arundel County, though, for only a couple more shifts. Um, he's getting ready to retire. God bless him. Um, and also my significant other is still active in the volunteer service in Prince George's County that she no longer rides. Uh, you heard that I started in as a volunteer, did 35 years in Montgomery, but uh, there were some events that occurred that really kind of drove me in this direction um, and how I, I got to join Karen here. Um, I have, I had two very good friends, one of which I went to recruit school with, and another one was a firefighter on my shift when he came out of recruit school. And uh one of them, the, the firefighter, uh, had a near-death experience on the job, uh, and that kind of that kind of cooked him. He was done after that. Now he never was able to come back, even after two years of uh, uh, therapy. And the other one had a nervous, as it was a captain, the guy I went to recruit school with, and he had a nervous breakdown on the job as well. And they both retired out of that. And unfortunately, there's another thing, and I, I don't know if I've mentioned this to Karen before. But Montgomery County went through a spate of suicides and we had eight suicides in a three year period uh, a number of years ago, probably five years before I retired. So this would have been in the early 2000s. So those kind of things kind of drove me in this direction to figure out what can I do about helping to fix this problem. Okay, um, I think you all are aware 
that you know fire fighters, emergency medical providers, and police share the distinction of having one of the most stressful occupations in America, along with active duty military and pilots. Um, but that's changed, particularly since COVID has hit us. Um, you know, there's another a whole slew of, pro of professions that are joining us in, in this stress-related environment. Uh, the medical profession need, and these are the people you you interact with on a regular basis in the emergency room. The nurses and the doctors and the techs are all getting their butts whipped. Um, and people don't seem to appreciate it. They went from heroes to zeros in a very short amount of time. Um, where they were, were doing things, now everybody seems to hate them for whatever reason. Um, and then there's also just the, the folks that are uh, providing community facing services, you know, the, the, the young man or woman at the 7 Eleven stores who has to deal with a, a hostile uh, customer that comes in because they have a policy for wearing masks. Um, you know, there's a whole range of behavioral issues that are associated with this. We, we, we see unfocused anger, we see withdrawal, drug and alcohol abuse, sleeplessness. On the job, there's also the issues of we see tardiness, we see sick leave abuse, uh, increased injury rates, safety failures, burnout, and many more issues. I know from experience that there's a, the stress leads to a lot of, of uh, um, job as absenteeism and disciplinary actions. I, uh, but the upside of all this is that you can learn resilient skills. And if you learn those and practice these things, not that we're necessarily going to prevent everything, but you can get to the point where maybe you can tolerate it a little easier. So, yeah. Um, Karen, training, training and resilience is, um, is intended to help ward off behavioral health problems from starting in the first place, to keep problems that have surfaced from getting worse, and to help keep normal human responses to stress and adversity from turning into responses that limit our ability to function effectively and productively. So resilient skill building adds a proactive element to supplement the programs that already exist out there to help address and treat behavioral health problems once they arise. And so all of these approaches are part of a necessary continuum to prevent and treat psychological distress. So what do we mean when we talk about resilience? How do you define resilience? Why don't we have some people share in the chat, how, what do you think of when you think of resilience? Okay, I know every firefighter out there has an opinion and they're more than happy to share them in most occasions, particularly around the breakfast table. So let's hear from some of you folks. Please. Okay. Bounce back after tough events. John Hickman, I appreciate that, that comment that you made about um, be, this being a safe space. Hmm. Being able to adapt and overcome anything. That's awesome. Ability to Ability adapt. To adapt. Okay. okay. Anybody else? I like that one uh, from Lori. Yeah, come back stronger. Up. Yep. Get back up if you're beaten down, come back stronger. I like that too. Yeah. Psychological resilience has a range of definitions. Uh, some of them include the capacity to respond to a stressful circumstance in adaptive ways, the ability to recover after significant adversity or trauma, the return to normal, quote unquote, normal after adversity, the ability to adapt, adapt to new and challenging situations, as many of you have said. And these various definitions are not incompatible, but I wanna share the definition that we like to use, which is that resilience is the capacity of individuals to respond in healthy and productive ways when faced with setbacks, adversity, and trauma. Okay. Understand something that when we talk about this, there's never a return to normal as it was, because that's looking backwards. What we need to do is look forward. So as we recover, we get, we should, uh, recover stronger, as, as Lori alluded to there. Um, we're looking for a new normal that takes into account the growth and the changes forced by the event. That's important. Um, it, 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 mm -hmm. If you're looking backwards, you're, you're never going to progress. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you don't incorporate the strength 
strengthening that you, you can, can, can possibly have. We all have the capacity to be resilient and to learn skills that increase our resilience. But depending on the environment that we're in at a given time, our relationships with others who are involved, and the inner resources that we bring to the circumstances, we can be resilient in one situation, but not in another. Or we can respond to the exact same situation differently, depending on how that particular mix of factors changes from one day to the next. Right. We're human. Um, I think that's important for us to recognize that we're all human and, and sometimes we're going to have trouble being resilient. There are times in my career, certainly, where I was ready to, to throw in the towel, but I decided not to, probably because I like the paycheck. Um, but, you know, there's, there's really no shame in sometimes needing help and, and finding some outlet or some means of, of assistance to deal with our vulnerabilities. Um, more importantly, these days. Where, where things are just so stressful on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, pressure comes at us from all different angles. Uh, there's the work front, the home front, sometimes even our leisure activities. Um, just, you know, you gotta be, you have to be strong enough to allow yourself to be vulnerable and take that step. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, learning how to be resilient is a matter of self-awareness recognizing patterns of unhealthy and unproductive thoughts and actions is the first step toward changing your responses to be more productive and more healthy. Yeah, resilience is a healthy psychological response to a stress event, pure and simple. Um, much as we like to, you know, we learn how to apply pressure to an uncontrolled bleed or opening an airway or laying out to ensure that we have a water source. Um, part of the ER is in there, that's my New England accent. Um, you know, we, we want resilience exercises to become muscle memory. So you don't have to really stop and think about what you're going to do. It's not a, oh, well, I need to do this. It's you just do it. That's, that's a key factor in, in the resilience training. Okay. So research has identified three main pillars of resilience in the emergency response community. These represent the protective factors that when they are developed and practiced, foster resilient thinking and behaviors. And we will go through each of these factors in turn. Okay. Um, Karen, before we get started into the details uh -huh. on uh, what we call forward thinking, um, please understand everybody that it's not about slapping a happy face on every situation. This is not happyology. Um, there is such a thing as too much or extreme inauthentic optimism, um, and that's a, that's a thinking trap. Um, what we're talking about is realistic approach and alternatives. You know, we're all going to face this, whether we like it or not, um, and doing the old happyology thing doesn't work. You're just pasting over a problem at that point. Mm -hmm. The first pillar of resilience has to do with how we think about and interpret events in our world. So we call this fort thinking. We call it fort thinking. Fort stands for flexible, optimistic, realistic, and thorough thinking. So when we practice fort thinking, we say we're building a fort to help protect us against adversity. Okay, and now I'll explain a little bit more what each letter in the word fort stands for. The F is for flexible. And anytime we find ourselves reacting consistently in any particular style of thinking or way of explaining the things that happen in our world, we need to remind ourselves to be more flexible so that we don't fall into the unproductive patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. Okay. Let me give you an example for this one. So, and we, and those who have been promoted up, will understand this. You know, your newly promoted officer, this is your first day with your new shift. Uh, you can be apprehensive, wonder if you'll be accepted, or you can take the view that the situation prevents an opportunity for you to mold the shift. You know, in the first, in the first approach, you've really subordinated yourself to existing shift personalities, and it'll be difficult to take charge and be the officer in charge at that point in time. However, if you take the second approach and you're taking on a leadership role, this will give you the opportunity to exercise your people skills and to bring a shift along for you so that you can accomplish the things that the mission that you've set out and also the mission of the department. 
You know, flexibility allows us to think around barriers. And that, that's a critical, critical point there. So the key question for flexible is how can I think about this differently? Yes. The O in fort thinking is for optimistic. Optimistic thinking is one of the key drivers of resilient behavior. The ability to see positive effects, the positive aspects of situations, benefits, and options lets us move forward, find solutions, seek support, and have hope. So optimism allows us to feel a sense of control over the things that we have control over while being able to let go of the things that we don't have control over. Okay, the key question here is can you find a silver lining? Uh, and that can, sometimes can be difficult, you know, and you know, instead of looking at what was lost, probably you need to look at uh, change your perspective and look at what was saved or gained. Um, we see this argument played out routinely in trying to determine the value of fire departments with damage assessment. Or we report what was lost, we never report what we saved. That, that's a big issue. It's continued for years. Um, and, you know, it, we have to change our perspective here. What, what, what are we saving? Not necessarily what are we lost. Now, R is for realistic. As Mike said a minute ago, optimistic thinking is not blind optimism. Extreme optimism can actually hurt us because it blinds us to the realities of the situation. But realistic op optimism lets us take negative events into account but not be paralyzed by them. It, it lets you see opportunities and reasons to have hope when the going gets tough. Yeah. Um... Couple things here, uh, you know, key key question, what's really going on here? Um, we have to keep in mind that we don't really own any of the problems we respond to. Uh, we're there to help mitigate the actual or perceived emergency. Um, since firefighters always love war stories, I'm gonna tell you about some, an incident that happened early in my career where we handled a service call to assist a citizen with an unknown odor. Um, it was only after we developed severe headaches and repeated questioning that we found out that the homeowner had sprayed undiluted pesticides throughout the house to get rid of fleas. So, of course, three of us went to the hospital with, with some uh, minor pesticide poisoning, got to swallow some really nasty tasting stuff, um, and it turned into a hazmat incident, and he got a free carpet replacement out of it, I guess. But there were some things we missed. I, I, I should have keyed in on the fact that there was a... a um, a pesticide sprayer in the living room sitting next to the door never even entered my mind so you know I should have figured what is the real story here that's that's the key here what was the real story and I missed the clues mm -hmm. on that one and this also could apply to your story T in fort is for thorough so that's making sure you haven't missed any details thinking through different ways that you can interpret an event and when you see that an event can be interpreted in different ways, you realize that you have a choice about which interpretation you go with. Yep. What other factors may have contributed to the problem? You need to, to kind of thorough, you got to, you know, try to get the 360 view of what's going on. And sometimes what you think is the problem may not be the problem. And that allows you to adjust. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions to this point? If so, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, we will go on. Our second pillar of resilience is called coping capacity. When our coping capacity is strong, we have the confidence to be able to deal with stressful and adverse situations that we face at work, at home, any aspect of our lives. Coping capacity is the ability to marshal not only our internal, but also our external resources that are available to help us deal with and manage any kind of stressful event. Okay, it is, it's, you know, COVID capacity is rooted in self-efficacy or the belief in ourselves that we can overcome the adverse situations we, we face. Uh, having been a firefighter for many years, I know sometimes that we tend to approach uh, the job with the fact that we, you know, put on our blue leotards and our red cape, pretend we're Superman. Um, but there are other resources available. We're, we're not, not all like that. Uh, you know, what are some of the resources we have available to help us through this? It's not just all about ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
um, we have we have sometimes have to reach out. You know, even Superman was, you know, had a problem with kryptonite. <laughs> and research shows that the more coping capacity a person has, the less likely that person is to suffer symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So, all right. So, what kind of internal resource do you have? You know, you've got your faith. If you're a religious type, you don't have to be. You could have faith in yourself. Uh, what about your health? That's always a good one. Uh, attitude, uh, resolution, objectivity. Are you the type of person that's uh, inclined to look at things objectively versus subjectively? Um, what are some of the external resources you have? We saw that early when we, we did the, um, the little poll. Uh, we saw time in the gym, hobbies, spouse and significant others, friends, shift mates. And this all leads us to the third pillar, which is social support. Okay. And I want to just address John's comment, coping, capac co coping capacity is relational. Did you want to explain a little bit more about what that is? How you mean that? I don't know if we can, can you unmute yourself? Maybe say a little something about that. I'd have to, I can't type it out, but. Okay, that's fine. To relate to any situational is based on their previous experiences and challenges that they have themselves overcome. Therefore, what one person like the rock climber, for a person like me who's never climbed a rock, well, to me, that would be a total relationship issue. But for someone who likes dinosaurs, maybe that's a pet to them. So like I said, relational based on experiences have allowed you to do and earn within your own makeup of psychology. Okay, Very thank much. you. Thanks for that perspective. Um, and you, yeah, I, I agree with that. Right on target. Okay, so let's go to the third uh, pillar of resilience, which is social support. Now, social support refers to the relationships that we have with coworkers, supervisors, family, friends, and others with whom we interact in our community. Uh, the people we can call on to provide support and to have our back in times of adversity. There is a rich body of research indicating that positive and high quality social support can improve our resilience to stress and is a protective factor against developing trauma related disorders and negative psychological effects from stress. Yeah. Does anybody in our audience believe that this probably presents a double edged sword for us? You know, as our shifts work together and play, we often play together. Uh, we go to our parties, we attend each other's grand events, you know, weddings, birthday parties, all those other things that we share. But on the other hand, everybody knows that it's everybody gets a turn in the barrel. And uh, it's because we're so close to our shipmates that they know our weaknesses and they take advantage of that knowledge. And they certainly know how to push our buttons when they're just looking for a response. Uh, it's probably not overly malicious, but um you know, sometimes being that close can be a disadvantage. Um, I think in a lot of cases, we, we tend to shortchange ourselves by not looking outside our profession. Um, the people outside of first have just as much to offer us in terms of social support. And in some ways, it's very good to, to reach outside the profession so you get a, a different perspective on, on what, uh, what, what we're facing um, and what we think of as what we're facing. You know, constantly being in the echo chamber, uh, we, we forget that others face difficulties in their lives. We're not alone. We're all dealing with the vagaries and problems that are associated with everyday living. Uh, camaraderie is wonderful. I can't say enough about it. I would never change the 35 years, 40 years I spent in the fire service. Um, camaraderie is, is wonderful. I miss the people, not necessarily the job. Um, but it keeps us from developing and strengthening our relationships outside the fire station. You know, it's a matter of maintaining balance in your life. Yeah, and I, I appreciate, John, your comment. No person is an island unto themselves. It's true. Um, now, quickly, how the three pillars work together. Research tells us that these three pillars work together to increase resilient responses. And looking at this graphic, the greater your level of coping capacity, the more likely that fort thinking and social support will result in a resilient response to traumatic events. 
And that's because the research connects stronger feelings of coping capacity with being more solution focused, acting and adopting strategies that produce better outcomes. And these happen to be characteristics of forward thinking. And in addition, high levels of coping capacity better enable us to find, cultivate, and maintain social support. Yeah, that feeling of, yes, I can, and I've got this. And, you know, they, they motivate us to, to practice realistic optimism and seek solutions. They also energize us to seek out and strengthen the support we need from others. Um, at the same time, the more you practice forward thinking and develop your social support network, the greater your feelings of coping capacity will be. And, and you have more resources, then it's a, it's a synergistic effect. And the, the more you practice this, the easier it gets, and the more support you have. And, and um, you know, it's, it's awful hard to look for social support when you don't feel like being around other people. But, you know, if you practice that stuff, it gets easier and you can reach out. And then you build more social support and it just kind of flows. Everything kind of works in, in, in sync. Um, any questions to this point? Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. When we do our regular resilience skills class, we go into each of these pillars in greater detail and we teach a variety of skills to strengthen each pillar. But because our time is limited today, we're gonna guide you through three activities representing each of the three pillars. And you'll be able to use them as part of your behavioral health self-care toolkit. So under the pillar of fort thinking, we're going to do an activity that was going to help develop your skill of self-compassion. One of the more common thinking traps that can lead to psychological distress is called personalization. And that is you tend to <clears throat> blame yourself harshly whenever anything goes wrong, regardless of the facts of the situation or any extenuating circumstances. Okay, um, Karen, there's a really good uh, uh, statement in, from Rich uh, mm. to everybody. I think it's important to make sure, you know, do you think the pandemic has had any significant negative effect on our social support systems mm. and any strategies we might have to, to address that? Okay. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that immediately? Um, I actually do believe it has had a negative effect on our social support systems. Uh, you, you can't practice isolation and, and be outgoing. And, uh, you know, so every time you get a potential exposure, you're supposed to go into social iso isolation, social isolation uh, for a period of time. And that, that means you're now limited um, to Zoom, phone calls, and things like that. So, you know, what happens is, is that, you know, as humans, a lot of our communications is through nonverbal expression. We look for body language and things like that. And if you're in isolation, it's awful hard to do that. You know, even, even if you're, you're practicing social distance from six feet away and we have a mask on, we can't see facial expressions as easily as we normally would. So yeah, I do think it's had a negative effect on our social support systems. Uh, how do we address that? Um, you know, that, that's a good question. I'm, uh, Anybody who has, reach out more. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, in some ways, my social support systems have improved uh, during the pandemic because I've done a lot more activities outdoors with people where, you know, you don't have to worry so much about the distance. And, um, you know, so meeting people for walks, uh, Ha you know, having a drink or a cup of coffee with somebody outdoors, even in the worst of weather, um, I kind of mm. affected, you know, just bundling up and getting out there. And it's, it's caused me to appreciate nature a little bit more. And um, yeah, I know in my community where I live, the, uh, um, the big thing was, was people would get together and go walking in the morning. They could walk and stay six feet apart. Right, but right. That, that was a big social activity for 18 months in my community. People just getting together to go for walks. Yeah. And John's correct. No real substitution for human contact. Okay. 
We have somebody raise his hand. Greg, can you unmute Greg? yourself? So I, th I think one, like you said, the self-isolation has really taken on um, a lot of people and we're seeing it now more as people start to come out and seek mental health services that are delayed three to six months mm. um, where before finding mental health services weren't as, or that delay wasn't there. Mm. Um, and I, I kind of heard a, a coworker refer to work when we were the essential workers as being kind of like a work release for a prison. Um, <laughs> wow. It, it yeah. made complete sense to me because you literally would leave, go to work, come back and be in the same amount of people and see the same things over and over again. And it really drove people um, crazy. Yeah. And one thing that I think I'm seeing a lot of now more is division on just the pandemic itself, the handling of it, where people disagree with how things are done, uh, um, vaccine mandates, things like that. And it's really starting to tear friendships and relationships apart because it is such a hot button, button topic. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's the question for the group, but um, do you think now that people are coming out of isolation, there is a readjustment period to, um, becoming social again uh, versus maintaining that isolation for 18 months as much as you possibly could. Now, all of a sudden, you're, and maybe this is the, what we're seeing manifest itself with the, uh, with the stuff is that there's now this rebound reaction. And some people might feel it's, it's um, uh, mental health services increased 850% during COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, because we've got the um, the Delta variant, and, you know, who knows what other variant? <laughs> no, Lori, you can't go back. <laughs> I'm an introvert too, Lori. <laughs> okay. All right. We should we should move on though. But I appreciate the humor. Okay. So we were talking about self compassion. Uh, one of the more common thinking traps that, that can lead to psychological distress is called personalization. I do this a lot myself. You tend to harshly blame yourself whenever anything goes wrong, no matter what the circumstances are. And an antidote to personalization thinking trap is practicing more self-compassion. So self-compassion is essentially being kind and understanding to yourself when confronted with your own personal failings. And it involves recognizing your suffering, your failures, and your frailties as part of a shared human experience. Okay, you know, um, a lot of it is, revolves around the perception of failing. Um, you know, in the fire service, uh, I think everybody's heard the old citizens once, fire department, nothing. We, we have a fatality or something pretty significant. And I think in some ways it does us a disservice, even though it's the gallows humor out there. Um, we always seem to take on responsibility for things that aren't really our responsibility. We're there to help, but it's not our problem. Yeah. When you practice self-compassion, you're directing the same kind of charitable feelings toward yourself that you would toward others who are suffering. Uh, people who suffer from PTSD tend to show high levels of self-criticism and they obsessively think about negative and upsetting experiences and situations. And a self-compassionate mindset has been shown to help alleviate self-criticism and rumination, that thinking of things, same things over and over again. It acts as a buffer against the impact of negative events. Yeah. Basically treat yourself as you would treat a patient. Mm -hmm. We never, we never tell them it's their fault. We might take it, but we certainly don't tell them that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, there are three components of self-compassion. Uh, one is self-kindness, and this involves providing warm acceptance, care, uh, and understanding of yourself as opposed to harsh judgment. The second is mindfulness, and this is just simply an awareness 
of your own pain and struggles. And, and just a moment, it's not like to wallow in it, but just a moment of mindfulness is all you need to be in contact with your painful feelings without over identifying with them. And the third is a common humanity. So this recognizes your connectedness with other people who suffer. So we're all imperfect. We all suffer at some point or another. And while, <clears throat> while not all suffering is the same, of course, all suffering is worthy of compassion. Okay. I think, um, you know, <clears throat> Karen, you and I have to talk about this many times is that, you know, many times our feelings about failure and, and those things that go with being too hard on yourselves find their roots in embarrassment. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier about the blue leotards and the red cape. We all like to think we're going to come into this job and make a big difference. And sometimes it's just not going to happen. Um, but we don't like to accept that. We, we are embarrassed that we can't, we don't succeed or, or whatever the case may be for whatever reason. We blow things out of proportion. We think everybody else will, will, will see our mistake when in reality, we're the only ones that notice. Um, mistakes are part of the human experience. Um, I think, I don't remember exactly how, but um, you know, think back to the first time you went to a, a dance as a teenager and, and you got up to dance and you thought you were going to make an absolute fool of yourself and you were convinced of it. And so you were afraid to get up there. You were embarrassed. Uh, but the reality is nobody noticed except you because they're all thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah. your mistakes are part of human life. That's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the three components of self-compassion, keeping them in mind, the exercise that we're going to do now is to craft your own personalized self-compassion mantra. And I know Mike's got a problem with the word mantra, but this is a <laughs> set of memorized phrases that you can repeat silently to yourself whenever you want to give yourself some compassion. And this mantra, which is unique to you because you're going to craft it, is, is most useful in the heat of the moment when you feel strong feelings of distress arising. Okay. Right. Yes, Karen, some, I, <laughs> I've been in the fire service for way too long. Um, I think the mantra is probably a little too soft for our, our self-received machismo um, of our pro profession. It's, uh, I prefer to think of it as self-talk and um, it's probably a good thing. You can only see me from about the shoulders up, uh, but I used to run a lot. Um, till my knees went bad. And, uh, you know, I, I ran religiously six to eight miles every day. And I would tell myself when it got tough, when we were going uphill or whatnot, that, all right, you only have to make it to the next telephone pole and you can stop. And then I'd make it to that telephone pole and I'd say, okay, well, you did that one. Make it to the next telephone pole. And that's, that's how I would get through my eight mile runs. And, uh, it, you know, that, that was my way of acknowledging the difficulty, but at the same time, giving myself the leeway to just move a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so the goal here is to come up with four short sentences that are personal to you to remind yourself to be self-compassionate. The first sentence acknowledges that you're in pain or are having a hard time. So something along the lines of I'm suffering right now. The second sentence reminds you that suffering and imperfection are part of that shared human experience. So you might say something along the lines of, everybody feels this way sometimes. The third sentence shows how you want to give yourself kindness in this moment, right? So I, I show compassion for myself the way I would show compassion for <clears throat> anybody in my care. And the final sentence sets a firm intention to be self-compassionate right? I, I will give myself the kindness I need. So here's a, an example of, of a self-compassion mantra that I use for myself. And, um, you know, Mike mentioned uh, being in the barrel, everybody gets their turn. So my, my self-compassion mantra is, this is my turn in the barrel. And yeah, everybody gets their turn in the barrel. Uh, this too shall pass, things will be okay. And right now I'm going to give myself a break. Okay. I use a little bit different approach, obviously. Um, and anybody who, who's known me for any period of time knows, knows that it, uh, I'm always saying that life is good. You know, I'm on the right side of the grass. So, you know, everything else is just icing on the cake. And I, I truly do believe that. Um, it's my way of acknowledging that, you know, okay, well, today was a little bit on the rough side, but, you know, there's always tomorrow. 
then as long as I wake up, it's all good. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's how I approach it. And I really do do that on a regular basis. It, it may not be a mantra, but it's close. We can call it one. What's that? We can we call, can it, call it a mantra. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so now it's your turn to come up with your mantra or self-talk for self-compassion. Uh, we'd like you to think of four sentences that seem most comfortable to you. And we'll give you a minute or two to think of some ideas for what to say. Obviously, whatever you come up with now isn't going to be cast in stone. But if you follow this format on the slide, um, and anybody who feels comfortable sharing all four sentences or just a couple, you can put them in the chat. Okay. We'll give you a couple right. minutes. You don't have, yeah. If you don't want to write it down, raise your hand. We'll be more than happy to listen to it. Yeah. How many times you told yourself, no biggie, I'll give it another shot. Anybody out there? How are you going to talk to yourself the next time you need to give yourself some self compassion? Okay. Sean, thank you. <laughs> this is really hard. Life can be really hard. May I give the same compassion to myself that I give to others. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Sucks for everybody sometimes. <laughs> no, good. Yeah, yep, there you go. All right. Excellent. I, I imagine that goes with the horses, the pitchfork and the bucket. <laughs> ah, so you know how to shovel out the stalls. <laughs> I like that. Yep. Okay. Hey, I just wanted to underscore, you know, how important, um, you know, this this kind of activity has been for me over the years. Um, yeah, I, I, I find sometimes and I fear sometimes that when people listen to these trainings as I have over the years, you know, there's not always a growth mindset, right? It's sometimes it's kind of uncomfortable to work on these types of activities. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to reinforce, yeah, how important it's been to me in my own, you know, journey through life and yeah, during a really hard time in healthcare and and in life, right? Life is hard. <laughs> it can mm -hmm. be really hard. So anyway, yeah, but it looks like things are picking up. So I love that in the chat. And yeah, you know, I just want to reinforce, I, I'd love to see people spend some time and really try to take this in and to try to, um, yeah, grow a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And thank you for everybody who's sharing. That. Yeah, um, if I may real quick uh brian i like yours but it reminds me of when i used to be able to run uh you, know, you get to the point where you want to stop before you need to have you thought about applying that to your shifts where you're working a shift and it is just dragging it seems like it's never going to end you're running your butt off and you just oh man it's just you're, you're really getting tired and you can apply that same mentality that same methodology let's put it that way okay i only got three more hours to go i, I can take a break um and apply that same thinking to your to whatever is facing you on your particular shift at a given time you know, break it down into manageable bites the old eating an elephant routine mm -hmm. john i like your uh, i like that weak, weak doesn't define me i'll be strong even when i'm weak that's great oh there you go human and allowed there to you make go. mistakes amen very nice. Brian has a vision of, of his mantra. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
There you go. Break it down. Right. Go through this one and the next one becomes easier. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much to everybody for, for uh, sharing. And I hope that the rest of you do work on your own uh, self-talk, self-compassion, self-talk after we're done here tonight and, and use it, um, you know, memorize it and, and use it when you're feeling you're having a tough time. It, it really does make a difference. Very nice. Okay. All right. Well, see, we've got that. You know, um, I don't know what else to say. I think I think the folks are getting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So should we move on? Yeah. Should we move on to our next. All right. So now we're going to do an exercise that supports the resilience pillar of coping capacity, and we call it living your values. By way of background, I want to talk about character strengths. Character strengths are considered universal positive qualities and values that help define us and lead us to being our best selves. So we demonstrate our character strengths through our thoughts, our emotions, our decisions, and our behaviors. In the earlier part of the 21st century, researchers set out to develop a common language of strengths, and they identified 24 characteristics known as the values in action, or VIA, inventory of character strengths. There is a free survey you can take at the link on the slide, and I also put it in the chat. I put it in the beginning of, of, of um, when we first started, but um, we, can, we can put it again in the chat later on. Um, but this free survey uh, can give you a ranking of your strengths based on your answers to a questionnaire. And I encourage you to take that in your own time. For now, we're going to use uh, this list of strengths and interchangeably call them values for our next exercise. There is a subset of character strengths called signature strengths. And signature strengths refer to those character strengths or values that are most essential to who we are, that we most identify with, and that make us feel most like ourselves. In other words, more, more genuine and authentic when we use them. And that's because our values reflect what we care about and what gives our lives meaning. Um, examples of my signature strengths uh, are love, judgment, and gratitude. Mike, what are yours? Mine or judgment as well. Uh, forgiveness. Um, it's, 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 it's not a hard thing to forgive somebody. Don't forget, but to be willing to forgive. Um, love of learning, obviously. Uh, you know, I, I was on the forever program until I got my PhD and I'm still looking for that, that next boost uh, to learn something new. Um, I try to make it a, a, a habit um, to learn something new every day. Uh, I read religiously. If, if I don't have four books going at any given time, something's wrong. Um, and then patience. Um, and I really look at patience and I, I've, I've said this often enough that, you know, I look at patience as merely stubbornness turned inside out. Um, because I'm just not willing to, to give up. And that means sometimes you got to have patience with yourself mm -hmm. and with other people. Yeah, nobody's perfect. Yeah. And John makes a good point that um, core values is another way to talk about signature mm -hmm. strengths. Uh, research shows that when we focus on our top personal values for just a few minutes at a time, when our sense of what is truly important to us is in the forefront of our mind, we're less likely to be affected by adverse events. We're better able to cope with stress. In other words, we have increased coping capacity. So this next exercise is designed to help you understand how the things that you do in your life reflect the, your values, your core values, and why those values are important to you, which then equips you to better handle the stress associated with what you do in life. Yeah. Um, Karen, I, th I think we, we need to point out here that your core values are not static. They change as, as you go through life. Um, they may have, most of them, you know, there's going to be some that are going to remain, but uh, as, as your circumstances in life change, those, those things may change with those core values. Um, a traumatic event 
uh, in our lives can cause us to reflect and change our values. And personal um, uh, issue is for me, my valuation of family changed dramatically. Um, I lost my, my father, my kid sister, and my mother like 14 months apart in, within three years. Um, there's now just my brother and myself. And my value of family changed dramatically as a result of that. Yeah, and, and to back up that point that Mike just made, my, my signature strength of gratitude surfaced for me um, after my older son had a stroke nine years ago. Um, he's doing really well, by the way, but he's had to be really resilient to overcome the setbacks that he suffered from this stroke. And I was not only so grateful that he survived, uh, but also for the first responders, the medical professionals, as teachers, our coworkers, friends and family, everybody who provided support during that difficult time. So it was really hard for me to feel sorry for myself or for our family because I was feeling so grateful. Yeah, there's another part to this also, and that you know when you you can take a strength that. Uh, maybe not uh, as as intense as you would like it, uh, maybe not as curly as high as on our list as we would like it, but these core values can be developed over time. You can work on them and, and bring them up to where you would like to see it in, in there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, Karen, do we have that? There we go. Um, you know, look at this list of, of, of personal values on the slide. Right. You can, that one right there. Yeah. Uh, you can choose from the list or think of a value that's not on the list and that just needs to be important to you in some way. Choose the top value you perceive you live or aspire to live. And if you, you remember, you don't have to justify your, your chosen value to anybody. It just needs to make sense to you. That, that, that's important. It, it's, you don't have to validate this with anybody but yourself. Um, anybody want to share uh, what value you chose or values? And if you don't feel like typing it into the chat room, feel free to raise your hand and chime in. Honesty and love of learning. Good ones. I like Brian. <laughs> Service. Okay. Nice. Yeah, it doesn't have to be on this list. Okay. Perspective, yeah. hope, and kindness. Love it. I, I like that one. Uh, you know, Rick and Randy. Um, I used to work with a master fire fighter named Bill Sweeney. who's always, every day, he would say this at least once. You know, it's nice to be nice. That was it. That was his mantra. Mm -hmm. See, I'm using that word, Karen. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, gratitude. Yep. That's, that's mine. Perseverance and creativity. Excellent. So now once you have your, your top value, you can just pick one for this exercise. Oh, there we but go. We'd, we'd like you to, um, to make, your value into an active, actionable statement on how you live this value. So we're calling this your value statement. Um, oh, John. Aaron, can we back? Can we backtrack yeah. this a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw this. Uh, John, uh, for Fausto, if I'm pronouncing this wrong, I'm sorry. Um, with all the negative news and pressure, it's tough to ID something when you're constantly told you're evil. Um, I think this is what you bring out right here. One of the reasons we put this class together, because um, you, you're being beaten down on a regular basis, and, and you have to be resilient in order to get past that. Um, is it a matter of developing a thick skin? I honestly can't tell you that. I don't know. Um, but that's where your social support is so critical. Um, and self-compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, 
it's tough. I don't. I, there's no easy answer for that. Um, but certainly, if you practice your self compassion and your your social support and all those things, probably becomes an easier cross to bear. Well, and and I would encourage you to get with somebody that you're close to, either a family member or a good friend or someone you know you're close with in the department, and have them identify some values that they see in you um, and we're gonna we're, we're actually going to be talking about this later on in the um, uh, in this workshop is to to do a strength spotting on another person because we don't always see these strengths in ourselves but other people can see them uh, and and lead us to a, a more uh, a fuller appreciation of of what we have in ourselves. Okay. Okay, so once we have our value, our chosen value, let's turn it into an active actionable statement on how we live it. So this will be our value statement. And the slide shows some examples of value statements that correspond to particular signature strengths. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the values that, that's in here is uh, seek opportunities for kindness. Um, for me, uh, what I used to do is, is I would participate and fill the boot. Fill the boot. I felt a, a great deal of satisfaction. It was a good chance for camaraderie with the, the other, other folks. But at the same time, I, I knew it was going towards a, a good cause. And I, one of the things I really, really enjoyed doing was volunteering for Christmas in April um, to help people who were uh, poor, couldn't afford to get their houses fixed up. And I'm not sure if, ever, if that's even being done anymore, honestly. Um, but it was an opportunity to, to give back to the community. Yeah. One, one of my value statements is uh, let creativity in. And um, I don't I don't necessarily consider myself a super creative person, but um, when my kids were younger, I volunteered to be a room parent at their school, for example, and I had a really good time researching and organizing fun events for them and their friends. And, and it helped me to develop that strength of creativity that I felt I needed to work on. Um, another value statement that I, that I use is to treat people honestly and fairly. And an example of how I live that value is that I have volunteered in recent years as a chief judge at our local precinct during election time. And that gives me a lot of satisfaction because I'm helping to ensure that everybody who's eligible to cast a vote gets the opportunity to do so. So that helps to satisfy my strength of fairness. And it puts me in a situation where I can solve problems and resolve issues. And that helps me to develop my strength of judgment. So, yeah. Go ahead, Karen. I'm sorry. Did you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. So, no. if, if you don't, so so once you come up with your value statement, we want we want you to think about how you express that value and how it makes you feel to express that value. Now, if you don't mind writing, it's something you can write about for a few minutes, either by hand or into your computer. Um, you don't have to write paragraphs. You can write bullet points. If you don't want to write, you can draw. <laughs> if you don't want to do either of those, you could talk about it with somebody or you could dance it uh, if that's how you want to express yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the point here is to think about these questions with focused attention. Um, and this isn't something, you know, we would like to see you put something here on the chat room or or share your thoughts with us verbally. But uh, if you're not comfortable with doing that, this is something you can do on your own. Because um, <clears throat> you can't write about something without thinking about it. And that will help uh, help you cement those feelings and, and those ideas with yourself. Um, it, you know, if you feel like it, please write something down in the chat room or, or raise your hand and, you know, we'll listen. We're more than happy to do that. And once you have your, your value statement, whether or not you write it in the chat or share it with us, we do encourage you to write it down for yourself and, and mm. you know, or print it out 
and put it in a place where you're going to see it often, like either, you know, on your desk or your, your mirror in your bedroom or somewhere in your vehicle, just as a reminder to live your personal values. And, and the have, next time, the next time you want to try this exercise too, you can choose a different value and write about how you express that in your life. So there yeah, are lots I, of opportunities. Yeah, I um, I don't necessarily write it down. Um, I have a predilection for for uh, the the signs that you can find um, in, in antique flea markets and stuff like that. Uh, and I have one that is in three places in my house. It simply says believe. And that is, uh, to me, it, 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 it's believe in yourself, believe in your future, believe in your capabilities. It's just simply believe that all possibilities are there. And it's in my living room. Um, I've got another one that says, you know, listen with the uh, ears of your heart. Um, that I, I found in a monastery. And uh, those are all different things that are, you know, capture certain things, how I believe, how I approach life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we put the, the list of the 24 character strengths and the link to the free VIA survey on this slide. Um, just so you know, in order to take the survey, you're going to need to register with the site. And oops. And, um, and just so you're aware, the site will try to get you to purchase a more explanatory version of the survey results. And that includes ways you can use your st signature strengths and all of that, but it's just not necessary. You look for where it tells you to download your free character strengths report, and that's that. And I also will um, put it into the chat along with all the other information that we we're gonna share with you. We'll do this you know, at least one more time before the end of this session. I, again, Karen, I wanna chime in again and just kind of reinforce, yeah, just how much I love this content and how important this work is. And you know, I know that it's gonna be difficult for folks to kind of you know, pull this all together tonight. But just again, the opportunity to um, focus on this um, after tonight and, and kind of moving forward. And I'll just share my own experience, you know, about five years ago or so when I was going through doing some of this own work for my, my own mental health, you know, I did this exact same exercise. So thanks for bringing this to the fire service. And the mantra that I came up with was I choose to serve as an educator and a mentor so those around me can thrive. And this EMS series was born out of that mantra, wow. mm. right? Love that. And there are so many opportunities that it shows up in my life and in many positive ways. And again, it's just being framed out of some, you know, an opportunity to think about how we want to express our value, what are our values and how do we express those? So I just wanted to, um, again, just chime in on, how powerful these exercises can be. I just think that, yeah, they're really spectacular. Thanks for bringing them to us. Thank you, You're Sean. Welcome. Well, we have one more exercise. And um, as we've learned character strengths that we've identified in ourselves and used to help us live our values are associated with greater life satisfaction as well as increased coping capacity. So for this next exercise, we're gonna use the 24 character strength again, but this time, as I alluded to earlier, we're going to direct the attention outward to help develop the resilience pillar of social support. Okay. Uh, the outward looking appreciation, uh, recognition and appreciation of others, character strengths are associated with more commitment to the relationship or a relationship uh, or several um, and greater relationship satisfaction. Um, and this is the practice we call strength spotting. Um, you know, as, as Karen, uh, uh, it can be used to help develop stronger connections with the people in our environment. Uh, this definitely goes back to what, um, um, shoot, where am I? Uh, shoot, I forgot who made the comment. Um, That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. 
one of the comments that were in there, um, you know, strength spotting, this is, you know, when you need, somebody needs a little bit of pick me up, sometimes it, it's good to, to kind of work in this direction. Um, it can be used at home, it can be used at work, uh, it can be used in your outside professional relationships, your outside uh, relaxation relationships. You know, we all like to be noticed in a positive way. And if the recognition is genuine, uh, we tend to have good feelings about the people who recognize us. You know, we don't want to be known as the bad example. You know, so when, when, when people say something positive to us, it's always a good thing. Mm-hmm. Kind of inflates our ego a little bit. And that's a good thing. So, so the key to observing and listening for character strengths in other people is to look for shifts in their energy on both the verbal and nonverbal levels. So non-verbally, we're going to look for things like uh, expressing positive emotions, their eyes light up, um, increased use of gestures, uh, positive, engaged, forward posture, and better eye contact. Uh, Verbally, we want to listen for a stronger and more assertive voice, improved speech vocabulary and delivery, and so just being more animated than usual, right? And this is what it might look like. There you go. Okay. Yeah. You know, on the opposite end of this, you know, there is certainly, uh, we know there's something going on with somebody who mumbles and keeps their eyes down, doesn't engage. You know, is it they have no self confidence? Are they embarrassed? Are they hurting? More than likely, they are somewhere. Are they hiding something? I think in a lot of cases with human nature, when we see somebody who refuses to or has difficulty interacting with other people, we tend to think they're hiding something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and we could be reading that entirely wrong. We have to be very conscious of that. Yeah. So, so there are three steps to effectively spotting strengths in other people. The first thing you want to do is label it. So name the strength based on your observations. The second is explain it. Describe what the person was doing when you noticed the strength. And the third is to acknowledge it. So you express appreciation for the strength you observe and affirm why that strength matters. Okay. Uh, general observations, I think we, we, you know, there's usually somebody on a shift or that we know of on another, at another station um, who has a character strength of, of humor. They're, that's the colleague who always finds the, the uh, humor in every situation. They know how to lighten the mood. Um, and it can be related to a specific event or it can just be something in general, uh, or curiosity. You know, the, the, uh, the coworker always has thoughtful questions during drills or class time or things like that. You know, think of a five-year-old who pesters you with why questions. It's not because they're trying to annoy you, it's because they're curious. And, and curiosity is a, a good thing. Gotta know about the world that's around us. Okay. The, the process of giving, uh, of strength spotting, It gives others a chance to think about their behaviors in new and positive ways and to feel that their strengths are noticed and that they matter. So you might point out a strength that another person takes for granted or just didn't even recognize. And it's important also when you do this that you are authentic and genuine in your approach. Okay. Uh, so, this behavior, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Karen, go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. Did you want to say something? Yeah, it, it, um, it, this may not be a behavior that comes easy. Um, it's something you're going to have to practice. Uh, it, it, you know, and this it goes without saying, would say it anyway. This is not an invitation to insult people uh, <laughs> or to give a backhanded compliment. In fact, it's just the opposite. You have to be genuine. Um, and it, that, that, that is a difficult barrier to get across in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in a profession such as ours, where we tend to be reserved with our emotions to begin with. Um, we don't want to appear weak. Uh, so we, we don't necessarily open up in a lot of cases, but you need to practice how to do that um, in order to, get, to make progress in this, in this resiliency, mm-hmm. in your so, resiliency. So Mike and I would like to now model how strength spotting is done. And you can notice how we label and then explain and then acknowledge the strengths that we observe. So who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, With regard, with regards to Karen, um, and I, 
one of her strengths is kindness. Um, I have found her to be extraordinarily kind in just about every situation I've ever seen her. I don't think I've ever heard her say a bad word about anybody, um, including her husband. Um, she always has a smile. Uh, and, you know, and she's in, in, in association with, with kindness, she's generous to a fault. Um, when we were developing this class and we spent many, many, many hours trying to pull this thing together, and we worked out of her living room, or excuse me, her dining room. And there was never a day that we didn't have lunch that she provided. And uh, I thought that was just absolutely wonderful. She's a great cook. So that was kind of cool. Um, and if you know me, you know I like to eat. Uh, so that was really good. Um, and then there's also the fact that she is tenacious. Uh, we have been through, I don't know how many iterations of this class. Uh, we had done two face-to-face -face pilots already. We did one in Fairfax and one in Howard County. Oh, you're talking about the full class. The full class. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, it, we finished the one in Howard, the second one in Howard County, and two weeks later, COVID hit. And we were back to the drawing board trying to figure out how to do this in a virtual environment. And Karen never gave up, not once. It was always, okay, well, now what's next? What do we do next? How do we make this work? So, you know, tenacious is tenacious or stubborn or, or resilient mm -hmm. uh, is part of our character strengths. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. So now I'm going to do one on you. And tonight I want to call out your strength of social intelligence. <laughs> You're one of those people who has never met a stranger in a social situation, sitting around with people having a beer, doesn't matter if you don't know them or not to begin with, you're, you're very skilled at finding common areas of interest and conversation. In business situations, you work as part of a team, you always respect the roles of each participant and always find a way that you can best contribute to the larger effort. Um, as an instructor at the National Fire Academy, you get consistently high marks from your students not only because you know your stuff, but because you're effective at communicating to your audience and with your audience. And you have an awareness of where people are emotionally. Um, you have a respect for others and a curiosity that means you do as much or more listening than you do talking. I know y'all find that hard to believe tonight because he's done a lot of talking, but, um, but I've learned a lot from you, watching you in various situations. And I appreciate and sometimes very much envy your strength of social intelligence. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> All right. Victory. Yes, victory. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so now, y'all, it's your turn. We'd like you to try it or prepare to try it. Think about somebody that you would like to strength spot with in the next day or two. And when you might have the opportunity to strength spot with them. And once you have that person in mind, um, try to mention who it is in the chat. It doesn't have to be a coworker. It could be a, a family member or a neighbor or, you know, whoever. Yeah. And here's a reminder of that list of strengths from the VIA survey. But you can choose any positive quality that you happen to notice. Once you have the person identified, then you think through how you would do that strength spotting. You know, what would you say? You remember, you have to label it, tell them what strength you noticed in them, explain what, the, what were they doing when you noticed it, or how have they exhibited that strength, and then appreciate it, say why it matters. And you know, feel free to, to jot some notes or bullet points down to remind you of the process and your observations and who you'd like to do this with. Yeah, and then go do it. Most importantly, as was it Nike to say, just do it. Just, you know, today, tomorrow, this coming week. Yeah, make it a point to tell your spouse or your significant other. I think sometimes we get sloppy in our relationships or lazy in our relationships 
with somebody that we've been with for a while and we forget to tell them the things that are that are why they're important in our lives we all want to be recognized and seen and valued and when you make someone else feel good in that way it it really does make you feel good too okay so you got anybody that's going to share anything or we we reach in the end of our end of our rope <laughs> yeah well their rope our rope okay um you know it's been it's been over an hour so i think that button's starting to kick in um, it's been about an hour and a half i think yeah so the button in our butts is starting to kick in a little bit um unless i we hear from somebody uh this kind of wraps up the three exercises uh you know obviously there's more to resilience than these three exercises but this kind of gives you a taste uh, are there any questions? Is there anything anything we can ask, uh, answer for you all? Or we we just want to remind you that you can't help others unless you take care of yourself first. And the reason you're here participating in this workshop is because of your commitment to helping others. So likewise, just commit to helping yourself too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. All right. Uh, using practice tools you developed in this workshop. The only thing I can say. You know, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.